Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Joanne Mark, President and CEO of Oak Valley Health, and that includes Markham Stovall and Uxbridge Hospitals and our Reactivation Care Center. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today. Uh, for those of you who are new to our town halls, I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about the organization. We'll then um, have an update on our Oxbridge Hospital redevelopment, where I'll be joined by Elena Pacheco, our Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, and also our Executive Lead for the redevelopment. And then we're going to turn our attention to the 2024 to 29 strategic plan and the related process. I've been here at Oak Valley for uh, eight years now, and I will say I'm absolutely energized by being able to make a difference, whether that's small changes that have a positive impact on our day-to-day -day, um, or big changes like new models of care or implementing our new strategy. What I can say is that it's a very exciting time for Oak Valley Health. We're coming out of a global pandemic. We have very big and bold redevelopment plans we're working on an ambitious new strategic plan that celebrates our past successes, but also sets a bold new direction for, for our future. And I'm looking forward to sharing all of that with you. With respect to the logistics for the evening, we've designated a couple of times throughout the, the town hall for your questions. Um, so if questions arise throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit them. You just click on the Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen, type in your questions, and we'll answer those during the designated Q&A portions of the town hall. And fortunately, anyone who's joining by phone will not be able to ask questions, but we will be sharing an email address at the end so that um, your questions can be emailed in to us. At this time, um, I'd like to conduct an Indigenous land acknowledgement. Oak Valley Health honors the traditional territory of the closest Indigenous communities, the Chippewas of Georgina Island and the Mississaugas of Scugog Island. The Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe have lived, worked, and existed on this land from time immemorial. This land is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with many Mississauga and Chippewa bands. We acknowledge that Indigenous peoples we're not asked to share their territory with settler populations and that we're all here as uninvited guests. We acknowledge and thank all generations of Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island for their commitment, contributions, and protection of the land and its resources. So as promised, I'll start with a bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with Oak Valley Health. Um, one of the pictures depicts the, the Markham Stovall site. Markham Stovall site is a large community hospital that opened in 1990, so about 33 years old. Very quickly, the organization started to run out of space due to growth in the surrounding communities. And then the subsequent redevelopment, which was completed in 2014, doubled the size of the original hospital. That rapid growth has continued, and once again, we're out of space. The Uxbridge Hospital integrated with Markham Stovall in 2004 under the corporate name of Markham Stovall Hospital. The Uxbridge site is a 20-bed rural community hospital that offers emergency, inpatient, and diagnostic services to people living in the region, um, in York region, as well as um, Durham and beyond. We have a third physical space that you see in the bottom of the slide. That's our Reactivation Care Center, or RCC, which we opened in partnership with other regional hospitals five years ago. The RCC is located near Highway 400 in Finch, and we operate a 28-bed unit that's dedicated to restorative care. And that's for patients who no longer need acute care, but who need more care than can be received at a convalescent facility or acute um, uh, rehab, for example. Many patients at the RCC wait there for long-term care, but many are also restored to a higher level of functioning, and some are even able to return home. We're hopeful that in the not too distant future, we'll be able to replicate that Finch RCC model in the Uxbridge community and be able to provide this kind of great service to even more patients and their families. 
As both of our hospital sites continue to grow and given our bold vision for the future, we knew we needed a new corporate name to better reflect our reality as a multi-site healthcare system. So we embarked on a comprehensive rebranding project and with almost a year of engagement. Uh, and then in the fall of 2021, we unveiled our new overarching corporate name, Oak Valley Health. The new name honors the proud history of the hospital's roots and also reflects the future of healthcare for the community. Interestingly, the name also combines two local and prominent geographical landmarks that span both York and Durham regions, the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Rouge Valley Park. But the hospital sites, Markham Stovall and Uxbridge Hospital remain the same. This is a slide of our catchment, which you see in the, uh, the pink area outlined. It's quite large our primary and secondary catchment area, all the way north to the south shore of Lake Simcoe, south into Scarborough, um, over to Vaughan in the west, and um, Oshawa to the east. As you can probably appreciate, and many of you will know, Oak Valley Health is an extremely busy organization that continues to experience significant growth well above the provincial average. And that's not a surprise to those of us who live and or work within the region. For uh, example, on average, we have about 100,000 emergency visits between the Markham and Uxbridge sites, which is a marker of size and scope. We have more than 3,000 dedicated staff, more than 550 board appointed professional staff and almost 1,000 volunteers between the sites. We offer a full range of clinical programs and services that includes acute medicine and surgery, emergency, mental health, and childbirth and children's services. And these programs are supported by a very efficient group of clinical support services that include diagnostic imaging center, laboratories, and pharmacy. And in addition, we have many corporate support services and departments that keep the organization as well as our buildings operational. Everything we do is grounded in our current mission and our unique honor to care culture. And we're driven by our vision to be a healthcare organization that provides care beyond our walls. So this is a, uh, our first um, uh, opportunity to pause and take any questions. I'll also mention that we have other members of our team here, Lisa Harper, who is our Senior Director for Medical Admin Strategy and Transformation, and Courtney Sorger, our Chief of Community Engagement. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, feel free to submit your questions. If you haven't already, by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, um, and uh, again, anybody joining by phone will not be able to ask questions at this time, but again, you can uh, send us your questions via email, which we'll share at the end of the presentation. Joy, we do actually have a couple questions um, just about um, our organization, if you want to answer those now. We can um, do that, sure. Thanks, okay, Courtney. great. So <laughs> one question, really good question that just came in. Are you still considered a teaching site for doctors? So we absolutely do teach uh, doctors and many other allied health professions. Um, we're a teaching affiliate with uh, University of Toronto for um, family medicine residents. Um, so lots of teaching uh, occurs. Um, we are we are not um, uh, we don't teach to the extent that you'll see in an academic hospital, but we uh, absolutely do um, an enormous amount of teaching and scholarship activities. And interestingly, we're just uh, putting the finishing touches on our um, academic and scholarship plan. So we'll be excited to be able to share some of that in the uh, the very near future. Great, great question. And another good one, Joanne, just in terms of um, the land around us being developed. I know we've had a lot of conversations about that, and we'll address some of that during the Uxbridge um, redevelopment, because that will be addressing some of the issues we're also facing here at Markham. But how are hospitals going to be able to keep up with the needs as we see that growth? 
So um, we're very fortunate that we do have uh, land assets and you're absolutely correct that we have a significant amount of growth, as I mentioned, well above the provincial um, average. So we have a building project, which you'll hear about momentarily at the Exbridge site. That will help to relieve a lot of the pressures uh, at the Markham site. And we are actually getting ready and have already uh, submitted um, an early plan to start a redevelopment of the, the Markham campus. So lots of, uh, lots of plans um, in the works and we absolutely need it because at both campuses, we're, we're out of beds. Great, and we'll get a chance to talk more about that later in the presentation. So those are the, oh, one more. Um, I think we'll save that one for later as well during the strategy maybe, but Joanne, uh, we can move along to the next section. Okay, thanks, Courtney. So um, that brings us to our future, and that's um, a really nice segue from the questions. Uh, that brings us to the planning we're undertaking for our future to, to meet those growing needs of the communities we care for, um, and particularly with respect to the redevelopment of our Uxbridge Hospital site. And uh, to summarize this update, I want to introduce Elena Pacheco, who's our Vice President and Chief Operating Officer here at Oak Valley Health. And she's been um, instrumental in getting us to this significant milestone in the re redevelopment of the Uxbridge site. So over to Elena. Thank you, Joanne. Good evening. I want to begin the update on our Uxbridge redevelopment with a patient story illustrating how this hospital provides such a vital service to the community by introducing you to baby Jack and his mom, Stephanie Barker. His family faced their worst nightmare when at just two weeks old, baby Jack suddenly fell seriously ill. But thanks to the team at Uxbridge Hospital, the nightmare eventually turned into her greatest miracle. One evening after his two-week appointment, Jack began acting fussy and developed a weak cry and became limp in his mother's arms. In a panic, they immediately called an ambulance. Jack was rushed to the nearest emergency department at Uxbridge Hospital, where the team jumped right in from the get-go and Jack's mother shared their experience. In her own words, she said, the team was all hands on deck, working tirelessly to care for Jack while keeping in close communication with my husband and I about what was going on during a most stressful night. We felt he was in good hands. I think we can all appreciate how scary this health crisis was for Stephanie and her family. Once resuscitated, Jack was found to be suffering from a cardiogenic shock, preventing much needed oxygen from reaching his vital organs. But the team worked to stabilize him until he could be transferred to Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. Today, he's healthy, and again, in his own mother's words, it's simple. Uxbridge Hospital helped save my son's life. It's a small but mighty, and I'm relieved that these doctors and nurses had the expertise, compassion, and tools needed for Jack. In an emergency like ours, you aren't looking for the biggest hospital. You're looking for the one you can trust to take care of your family, and that's what this hospital will always be to us. So in April 2022, we received government approval for the new hospital to be built on existing land, and they have now approved the functional program submission for the Uxbridge Hospital. We are working with an evaluation team to secure a design architect and develop a plan for the new facility. The next stage after design will be a tender for construction. Once complete, it'll be a brand new state-of-the-art building where patients will receive the highest quality of care and an extraordinary patient experience. The vision for Uxbridge Campus is moving to a community health hub. This includes acute, ambulatory, and emergency services, as well on the campus a long-term care and primary care services. Last year, we celebrated another important milestone for the organization and the folks living in Uxbridge and Durham region. In partnership with Uxbridge Health Center's physician group and Oak Valley Health, we opened the Oak Tree Medical Center, and this was also the first phase of the redevelopment at the Uxbridge site. Having an ambulatory building in close proximity to the hospital allows the physicians to work in the family practice as well as in the, in, in the emergency department and the inpatient units at the hospital to practice more seamlessly, train and collaborate with one another. Both York Region and Durham Region population will almost double in size by 2051. And in Durham, the 85 plus age group is projected to nearly double from 2021 to 2031. To help meet this growing need, the long-term care bill circled here in the map is another important component of our vision. 
And again, it's important to note that this portion of the build will be fully funded by the LTC operator that holds the licenses for those beds. I'm sure we can all agree that additional LTC beds are a much needed resource for the community and that the campus approach with an LTC on site will further support an integrated approach to care. The new facility will take advantage of cost and service efficiencies by sharing services such as loading docks and food services with the long-term care home. And in partnership with the LTC home, we are planning a post-acute unit to help build additional acute capacity across the region, including our Markham site, and really address some of the um, acute acuity here at the Markham site. With the view to the future, the rebuild will support modern care procedures and technology, including advanced infection control. Planning will ensure continuous service during construction and transition of the new hospital opening and the old one closing. The new facility will also take advantage of cost efficiencies by sharing services such as loading docks and food services with the LTC. As a result of these design efficiencies, the hospital will gain a great deal in terms of both size and features. The rebuild will support modernized care using state-of-the-art technologies, as well as advanced infection control standards. A wide range of labs and diagnostic services, including x-ray, ultrasound, CT, and hopefully MRI will be available to hospital patients and the residents at the connected LTC home. The new hospital will have greater diagnostic and laboratory capacity. A new cardiorespiratory clinic will include services such as a virtual cardiologist consultation. And in the addition of stress and pulmonary function testing capabilities, the cardiorespiratory clinic will support Durham residents for the early identification and intervention for heart disease. Now, government funds up to 90% of construction costs for hospital facilities, but hospitals and their communities are responsible for the remaining 10% of construction costs, plus 100% of the equipment, furnishing, and fixtures. That includes costly diagnostic equipment that would support these enhanced services. Building a new hospital in Uxbridge requires a tremendous collaborative effort between the province, the hospital, and its community. And look forward to sharing more in the not so distant future on the launch of a campaign in support of our new hospital. And keeping our community informed and engaged through the de design and build is a top priority. So forums like this, as well as updates on our website and newsletter, the link will continue. So I'm going to pause there and ask if there's any questions, please feel free to submit them um, and we will be answering them. Okay, great. Elena, uh, it's Courtney and we do have a question from Michael Kerr. Um, good question here. In the expert redevelopment, will it include advanced imaging and air ambulance? So I know you get that air ambulance question quite a bit. So. Yes, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the helipad will continue to exist at the Uxbridge Hospital. We will probably be the only hospital in the province with two sites and two helipads, so yay. Um, it will be relocated temporarily while we're um, conducting construction, uh, but then in the end state, it will be on top of the uh, hospital roof. In terms of advanced, it was advanced diagnostics, was that yeah, 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 just yeah. what other advanced diagnostics? Yeah, so again, as mentioned in my presentation, we're really hoping that we can land um, MRI, but all of the uh, current diagnostics will be advanced within the new hospital. So that CT, X-ray, um, and looking at uh, cardio rest as well. Okay, great. And just a reminder um, to attendees that you can add your question to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, will the new hospital have 24-7 emergency department? Another yeah. good question. Yes, that is a great question. And yes, it will be 24-7 an emerge department built into our functional program that has been approved. And I think, Elena, another good clarification there, um, and you mentioned this at the beginning of your presentation, is that uh, there will be a seamless transition from the existing hospital into the new facility and all of those services will remain open um, throughout that process. There will be no downtime. That is correct. So we will continue to operate in the existing hospital while we build the new hospital. Once the new hospital is built, we will have um, what we sort of call a transition team, getting everyone trained and familiar with the new hospital. We will then transition all of the staff, open up the new doors, and then make way for additional parking where the existing hospital is. So the existing hospital eventually does come down um, and additional parking is built within its spot. 
One of the other questions we've had too when we've been out speaking with the community, Ellen, is when exactly will construction begin? I know that we're moving into that. That's kind of the next big step, but when do you expect that that will begin? So currently with the design, um, we're aiming to have that completed um, just over 12 months. Uh, and if all goes well and ministry then has to approve the next phase, Courtney, which is construction, um, if the, that is seamless, we would then go out to an RFP for a constructor. So we are targeting uh, 2024 next year, fall, winter, um, to start construction if all goes according to plan. And then how long do you think that construction phase will take? Anywhere between 24 and 36 months. Okay, great. Um, we've got another question from Jerry Little Connor. Um, I believe the food for our hospital is now being brought in. Will the new facility have its own kitchen and staff? So currently the food is in-house at the existing hospital and it will remain in-house in our new design. There is a kitchen. It is a joint kitchen with the LTC to ensure efficiencies between both. Okay, great. And then just one other question we get quite a bit, um, Ellen, is just around the cost. I know you mentioned 90% funded by government. So the total project cost? The total construction cost is 154. And then we million, have, yeah. yeah, 154 million. Yes, thank you, Courtney. <laughs> and then approximately another 50 million, um, as I mentioned, for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. That 50 million is really what's funded by the hospital and raised by the community. So that would be what we consider our portion uh, for fundraising. Right. And that's separate from the long term care um, because that cover will be cost by the operator? Correct. All of the LTC will be built by the operator. Okay, great. Um, okay, so those are all the questions that we have for the extra tree development. Now, that doesn't mean you can't ask more questions on that as we move through this evening, um, but I'll turn it back over to Joanne. Thanks, Courtney, and uh, terrific questions. So thank you, uh, everybody, for your interest. Very exciting times for the community, for the organization. We're uh, super excited about um, all of this and what we're going to be able to do to support our communities. Um, so we're going to turn now our attention to our um, strategic planning process, um, and that will take us from 2024 to 2029, and this is where we'll also have some engagement. Strategy is um, uh, imperative to, to organizations because, as they say, in the absence of a plan, any path will do. So a strategy is really about making choices um, and setting our course, and of course, uh, focusing our energies and our efforts. This is a uh, just a snapshot uh, uh, or overview of our current strategic plan that was extended um, an additional two years, so from 2022 to 2024. That extension occurred for a variety of reasons, including our response to the, the pressures associated with the, the pandemic. But an assessment in 2021-22 uh, reaffirmed that we were absolutely on the right track with our three strategic pillars, delivering an extraordinary patient experience, embracing um, and supporting our community and empowering our people. Um, so we're still on the right track. But because it comes to an end in 2024, many months ago, we turned our focus to efforts on developing um, our next plan, which is an evolution of um, our current uh, strategy. Um, lots of engagement occurring. We've been gathering stakeholder feedback from many, many groups and individuals, including our, uh, our patients, our staff, our physicians, our health partners, and, and many more. And the project plan also includes involving patient experience participants. Um, you may know them as patient advisors, as well as members of, of, our, of our community, and we're well along the way. Time and time again, um, we've, we've heard that what makes um, Oak Valley Health special is our people and our unique culture. And so prioritizing the people that make our honor to care culture special has never been more important and will absolutely be instrumental to our success. So that's uh, definitely one of our priority areas and that's come um, through our engagement process to date. Uh, next, one of our greatest strengths is our ability to partner well with all kinds of stakeholders in order to meet the needs of patients and the communities we serve. So prioritizing partnerships is going to be absolutely essential for successful integration, which we know is critical to our future success 
as a healthcare organization. And, and finally, we know that the healthcare landscape is changing and continues to change along with our growing community. So with a, an innovation mindset, we'll continue to grow our programs and services and our space and prioritize scholarship and learning to provide leading edge care close to home. I think an, another uh, really important um, item to highlight is um, our values. The early engagement with our stakeholders, that, and that included our internal stakeholders, our community members, as well as our uh, patient experience participants or patient advisors, has reaffirmed our current values, trust, respect, compassion, commitment, and, and courage. These are the values that we live and we breathe every day. And we've taken value feedback from our stakeholders to help us enhance the definitions of our values that are attributed to each to help make them even more meaningful. And of course, the values are so important because they're foundational to our strategy, our code of behavior, and many, many more uh, initiatives throughout the, the organization. And of course, are embedded in absolutely everything we do. So we're really delighted that they resonated um, uh, so well and persist. So here's another opportunity to, um, to give your input. And uh, we do have some specific uh, questions for you, but before we get to that, um, uh, I'll just pause again for questions. And again, if you have questions, you can click on the Q&A button. Everyone's uh, doing that really well so far. That's at the bottom of your screen. Type in your questions. Okay, great. We do have another question. I think we'll shift focus maybe back to Uxbridge. Um, and then, as Joanne mentioned, um, you can add it in the Q&A box below, and then we will be moving into um, some more um, opportunity for input on our strategic plan. But for now, um, Elena, we've got a question from Jerry Lynn O'Connor again. Um, uh, am I correct stating that we will need to raise $50 million for equipment plus the 10% of the structure build, which would be another $15.4 million, or is that 10% included in the $50 million? Um, and then there's a second part to that just around, will any money be coming from Markham or is the fundraising solely Uxbridge? So I'll answer the uh, first question. Uh, yes, it's the 50 million is our contribution, which is the 10% plus ff &E, So that makes up the 50 million. In terms of will the money be coming from Markham? Uh, the Markham does have a hospital foundation and Uxbridge also has a hospital foundation. Uh, the Uxbridge Hospital Foundation and other revenues or streams of revenues will be contributing to our portion. So it's not only solely the expert foundation um, responsibility. And just to clarify, I know you, you did um, say this early, but the ff &E is the fixtures, the furniture, and the equipment. So That's all correct. of that is in addition to. Okay, That's great. Right. Um, and, and I'll just add, if I may, Courtney, that, um, you know, the I think the Oxbridge Foundation is doing a tremendous job um, uh, you know, raising support and interest in, in the community. And um, the support for Uxbridge, um, actually, there's significant support for Uxbridge, and we're tremendously lucky for that. But the support for Uxbridge, you know, extends beyond the, bound, the municipal boundaries of Uxbridge. Um, there are many, many um, interested and supportive individuals well beyond the community boundaries, and I think that's um, good for all of us. And then just a question about the long-term care um, home that will be um, built with this campus. Do we have a timeline for that to be completed? So their timeline's very similar to our timeline. They probably can get it up a lot quicker because they're, they're modular designs than we can. Um, they can probably have their LTC home up in about 18 months um, to two years. Uh, what we're trying to do right now is coordinate with the Ministry of Long-Term Care and the Ministry of Health um, because we are on um, a really tight sort of acreage. So we want to make sure that if we start construction first, we don't impede their construction, or if they start construction first, they don't impede our construction. So we're working through those details, but great question. And just on that as well, are we able to share the name of the operator of the LTC home um, at this point? Has that been finalized or confirmed? Yeah, so the existing Reachview site, which is down the street from uh, the current uh, Uxbridge Hospital, uh, currently have 100 licenses in the Reachview site. 
It is a very old class LTC. Uh, we're talking ward rooms, four to a room. Uh, they will be taking on the land lease at the expert site. And in addition to their 100 licenses, they've requested 90 additional licenses, which they've been approved for. Um, so they will be moving, which is Rivera, over to the expert site. And Elena, that'll probably then help them meet that, that closing timeline where long-term care homes will be required to meet a new standard um, by, I believe it's 2025 for those Absolutely. facilities. Uh, it would be a brand new standard, um, meeting all the new LTC standards as well, and uh, no more board rooms. So majority singles, which is great. Okay, great. One, just before we leave Oxford, I know that one other question um, that we get quite often is what will happen with the old hospital space once um, we move into the redeveloped space? Yeah, so that will become parking. Uh, again, it won't be demolished until we're moved in and uh, acclimatized to the new environment, and then we'll be working on demolishing the existing facility and creating additional parking. Okay, great. So those are all the questions we have for this um, section, Joanne, if you want to move through. To yeah, are there any other questions input? related to our strategic plan, plan development? I mean, thank you. Uh, I'll just thank everyone for your um, level of engagement. It's really it's really wonderful to get your questions. And certainly, I think that demonstrates the level of interest we have. And maybe we could just, sometimes we do get asked, Joanne, from the community, um, if we'll be sharing the new plan with the community. Absolutely. I mean, this is as much the community's plan as the hospital. So, um, you know, we hope through forums such as this and others that we can continue to, uh, to have that dialogue. Absolutely. Okay, great. So I think now we are going to move. Okay, so this is where we need um, your help. Um, we're launching our um, community survey tomorrow, and we're ready to share early access to that survey now. But before we get to that, um, I wanted to highlight one of the most important questions we're looking for your feedback on. Um, every question, of course, is important. Um, how, how we work to provide the most extraordinary patient experience and family experience possible is really important to us in terms of driving our focus for the next several years. Uh, again, a priority really central to our, our mission. Um, so we'd like to ask you uh, a question now. So this is where you get the chance to, to give your, uh, your uh, opinions and you'll, see, you'll be able to see the results. So a pop-up is gonna appear on your screen that asks a question related to extraordinary experience with multiple choice answers for you to select from. You can only select one of the choices, um, i.e. what's most important uh, to you. Of course, your selection will be anonymous. And again, unfortunately, those who join by phone um, will not be able to participate, but we're gonna show you the, the aggregate, aggregate results. So um, go ahead and, uh, Respond if you could. What would make an extraordinary patient experience uh, for you? So there's a number of choices, clean and welcoming physical space. I'll just talk while you're thinking. Um, close to my home, compassionate care, friendly care providers and staff, good communication about my care, the highest caliber of care possible, quick access to the care I need, quick connections with any community-based services I need, quick connections with any hospital-based services I need, and then anything um, that would fall into an other category. And we have the results actually, Joanne, um, just up on the screen um, in the room we're in, and we're seeing um, the highest caliber of care is really important, is really emerging, um, compassionate care, uh, quick access to the care they need, um, close to home is up there along with quick connections with any community-based services. So lots of good input on a variety of priorities for people. Okay, well, maybe just give it a moment to see if any more responses. Oh yeah, I see the bars moving. So people are still uh, clicking on the buttons. That's great. Yeah, and again, um, as you mentioned, Joanne, this, is, this question is also included in our community survey. So we'll be formally capturing um, this kind of feedback as well, and, and certainly taking note of the responses in this poll right now and looking at where priority and the focus will be. Yeah, this is really great because this uh, really shows us where um, what's most important to people and, and uh, so important for us to understand that. Great. So while people continue to do that, I think we can move to the next portion, which is um, 
Obviously, they can continue to add questions in, but Joanne, if you want to move along to the more formal community survey, we've got that sneak peek. Okay, uh, terrific. Thank you, Courtney. So again, as Courtney mentioned, um, I want to move now to the community survey that's launching tomorrow, and so you're the first um, actually to see it. Um, we need your feedback on how we can continue to meet your healthcare needs. So um, we're hopeful that you can take a few minutes of your time to share your thoughts by completing the survey. And again, this is anonymous, it's confidential. The link is provided in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'll just note that the survey is also available in five additional languages to English, French, Farsi, Tamil, traditional Chinese, and simplified Chinese. So you'll be able to select the, your language preference by clicking on the globe icon, icon at the top uh, right-hand corner uh, of the, the survey. And I've added that now, Joanne, so they should see that link in the Q&A box where we've been posting the questions that have been coming in this evening. Um, they should be able to click that and go right to it. Yeah, so we're hoping that um, it, if we look at the time, I think we're doing well. And if we can give you back a few minutes, then hopefully you can complete it now. But Courtney, uh, just uh, to, for clarity, for anyone who wants to wait and maybe do it with morning coffee or, or later on, um, what's the best way to connect to, to the survey? So we'll actually be sending a follow-up email tomorrow to everyone who has registered um, for this town hall. Even if they were unable to join us, they're going to get a direct email um, with the survey with instructions on how to complete it and the link right there. So don't worry um, if you don't have a chance right now. Um, so that will come to you uh, tomorrow and it's all online. We will also have this on our external website um, and promoting it there. And you'll probably also come across it on social media. And we're working with a lot of our community partners, um, both healthcare partners and community services to also share this um, more broadly with the groups throughout our communities. Um, so they will get it there, Joanne. We're also going to share at the very end um, of the session, once we finish with some more Q&As, uh, we're going to share an email where they can send us any additional questions or information they have. We'll have that up at the end as well. Um, I'll maybe jump to that now, Joanne, because we have another question um, that's come in a little bit different um, from some of the ones we've answered around redeveloping that, but I think that this kind of does speak to some of our work around our strategy. Um, so we've got a question about the landscape of healthcare is changing as hospitals globally face nursing shortages. What are our plans to recruit and maintain nurses? Oh, great question. And what I can tell you is that we recently launched um, a whole people plan that was um, based on uh, many months of engagement where we asked uh, our people what was most Im important uh, to them. And one of the things that we know is, well, we have to continue to recruit and we have to identify, you know, the value proposition, so to speak, for people that, you know, we're not going to recruit our way uh, out of the, the staffing shortages that will be perpetual and certainly is uh, exists well beyond uh, this organization. From a nursing perspective, and I think that there are things that, um, you know, no matter what discipline or area you, you work in, will be relevant, such as, um, you know, health and wellness and uh, continuing education. The, the issues for nursing are uh, specific, as they are for, for um, you know, a number of, of the disciplines. Um, we are um, working really hard, um, and government has been incredibly supportive with the, the new grad guarantee and uh, the use of um, clinical externs so that we can bring um, lots and lots of organizations before or individuals before they're finished their training programs into the organization, expose them to our culture, you know, our way of doing things. I think what makes the organization unique and so far, we have been able to um, retain, um, like the, by and large, the vast majority of those um, who've come in. Supporting um, new graduates, um, particularly in their early weeks and months of training, is, is really important to making people feel uh, comfortable and safe, not just emotionally, but physically um, and uh, competent in, in every way possible. So um, that's been very successful, and that will absolutely continue. We're working um, really hard hard at um, looking at opportunities to create um, as much flexibility as possible. Um, uh, for example, the ability to work in multiple areas, the ability to work um, flexible in different um, shifts, 
um, in ways that have not been uh, possible prior. Uh, we have um, engaged uh, a concept of skills facilitators to keep um, nurses, for example, who may have otherwise retired or we might uh, or were thinking of retiring, we have been able to um, entice them to stay, share their expertise. And um, some of our newer graduates have said that it's just been a tremendous support. And without that level of support, you know, as they in culture and develop and uh, make their way, um, it, it would be um, really difficult and they would have found it uh, difficult to stay. So these are just, you know, some of the things that uh, we're doing. As I mentioned, and I'm going to ask Elena to comment because she's uh, provided a lead on our people plan. We're really trying to create a value proposition where, um, you know, we provide an environment that is unique. We already know that um, our culture is particularly unique um, and uh, super friendly. And so we believe that once we can encourage people to come to us, that they will in fact uh, want to stay because we'll continue to find ways to mentor and support and um, you know, allow other to opportunities for, for growth and advancement. Yeah, I'm that, wondering if Ellen yeah, wants to add, to add to that, Joanne. I think also internationally trained students, um, definitely an opportunity there. And yes. The question was asking if we're inviting them. Yes, we are. Um, and the other thing that we've talked a lot about in our people plan are, are models of care. So it's really important because uh, nurses are a scarce resource. We really want to ensure that we're utilizing all of their skill set. Um, and we're looking at how do we support nurses with other models. So does that mean um, additional PSWs? We've launched a support services attendant. So they're for example, stocking versus a nurse stocking. So really looking at what tasks that are really non-nursing can be removed from the role and utilizing their skill set. Yeah, and just to add, thanks, Elena. I mean, that, that's super important. One of the things we heard through our engagement is um, that, you know, workload was a significant concern. And so I think these model changes and other supports will truly make a difference in how the work is experienced. We know people want to you know, do their very best. They want to make a contribution. They want to feel that what they're doing is valuable, but they don't want to feel overwhelmed and overloaded. And we really believe that the multitude of changes that we're making will truly um, you know, enable and nurses in particular, but not just nurses, to be able to um, come and practice and do what they were trained to do and feel supported by the team around them. Yeah, and thank you, Elena, for touching on the internationally um, trained, because that was actually the second part of that question. Would we be participating in those initiatives? Um, and as we wait for maybe uh, any more questions, we're opening it up. Certainly anything and everything um, that you have questions about, uh, we have some time still before we, we send you off to hopefully work on the survey. But I did have a question just around the logistics for the survey. So again, um, I've posted the survey link, the direct link to um, the online survey in the Q&A box. So if you open up where you've um, typed in some questions, you should see uh, a, previous, um, a previous post with a link there. Um, and that should take you, you should be able to just click right on that. Um, if it's not working, you might be able to just copy it and then paste it into your internet browser, um, but that should take you there. If you're having any trouble, please, um, don't worry, we are going to be emailing everybody who's joined us this evening and um, signed up for the town hall, a direct um, email with uh, all of the instructions and a link as well. So you'll be getting it um, tomorrow, but love to see that people are anxious to start doing that because we are having a little sneak peek of it tonight before it gets launched formally tomorrow. Um, so I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so maybe at this point, Joanne, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, but we could give people the time back um, and leave the, the um, screen up with the Q&A if they want to go on and, and start completing um, start completing that questionnaire. Yeah, thank you, Courtney. I think people always love getting a, a few minutes back. Um, again, if you have more questions you uh, and the webinar, you think of other things that's um, inevitable, please email us at courtcoms at oakvalleyhealth.ca. Um, again, the webinar has been recorded and will be available for um, anyone to view on our website if you want to watch it again. 
Um, I'll just conclude by saying this is a really exciting time for our organization um, and for the communities we, we serve and we care for. So, um, you know, on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your time, really appreciate your questions and your engagement um, in this process. Um, so thank you so much and um, keep your questions coming. We love to, we love to hear from you.